Welcome to Level 2 of Verbal Advantage. In the introduction to the program, I discussed the importance of building a powerful vocabulary. Now let's take a moment to talk about how powerful vocabularies are built. There are many ways to enrich your knowledge of words. You may have seen the Building Your Word Power feature that has been running for years in Reader's Digest magazine. Its vocabulary quizzes are fun, but unless you review the words several times and put them to work right away in your conversation and writing, the definitions are soon forgotten and you are back where you started. Moreover, the words are not presented in order of difficulty. They are a miscellaneous assortment, with easier words mixed in with more difficult ones. If you already know the easier words, testing you on them does nothing but flatter your ego. Likewise, if the harder words are beyond your vocabulary level, then your chances of retaining them are slim. In such a random quiz, designed for a mass audience, much of which, I would add, probably is not at a higher vocabulary level and is not accustomed to reading much more than Reader's Digest, it's doubtful that more than two or three of the words in each month's list will be challenging and useful to you. Not to mention that a month is a long time to wait to learn a handful of new words. So, what else can you do to improve your knowledge of words? You can always buy a book. There are many vocabulary-building books on the market, and some of them are quite good. Keep in mind, however, that even the best of these books offer little or no instruction in usage and pronunciation, and the worst ones merely contain a list of words and definitions, in no particular order, with quizzes that do not test how well you've assimilated the vocabulary, but rather how well you learn by rote. Another option is to take a class or do what you're doing now, listening to this interactive program. Any disciplined and structured study of words is always more beneficial than casual exposure. On the other hand, many vocabulary building courses and programs don't live up to their hype. Too often they force feed you a random selection of words and definitions that you must again learn by rote. That, I'm sure you will agree, is neither a pleasant nor an effective way to build your knowledge of words. And that is why Verbal Advantage introduces you to words in their order of difficulty, accompanied by specific information on where they come from, how they should be used, and how to avoid common errors of usage and pronunciation. But I still haven't told you the most effective way to build your vocabulary. Vocabulary building books and courses are an excellent start, but they cannot cover everything you need to know, and both must at some point come to an end. That is where the primary method of vocabulary building comes in. Have you guessed what it is? Reading. Simple, but oh so true. If you wish to continue to build your vocabulary after completing this program, in fact, if you want to retain the words you know right now, you must start reading more, reading widely, and reading something, even if just a few pages at first, every single day. That, of course, requires discipline. You need to set aside some time each day to read. An hour is great, but most of us have a hard time finding an hour when we can be undisturbed. You should be able to schedule 30 minutes, though, without too much trouble, and even 15 minutes of reading a day will help, provided you stick to it and choose your material with an eye toward building your knowledge of words. What should I read is the next question. Well, let's start with what you read now. Most Americans spend 15 or 20 minutes a day reading a newspaper. The newspaper is not the best place to find new words, simply because most are written at a 5th to 7th grade reading level. That is no accident, nor is it a comment on the inferior abilities of the nation's journalists. Newspapers must serve the general public, and the general public consists mostly of low vocabulary readers. However, some newspapers contain excellent writing. The New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Christian Science Monitor are particularly well written. Also, certain sections within any given newspaper are generally written better than others. For instance, in the editorial pages, you will read some of your paper's most talented writers and the syndicated columns of some of the finest journalists in the nation as well. Regardless of which newspaper you read, you will not do much for your vocabulary if you read only the sports section, the society page, the advice columns, or the funnies. 
If you're looking for interesting, useful words to add to your vocabulary, how about trying the theater, book, movie, and restaurant reviews? Many people also find the crossword puzzle a helpful vocabulary building tool. Weekly news magazines such as Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report can also provide a nutritious diet of good writing and challenging words, as well as the added benefit of keeping you up to date without taking up a lot of your time. And while you're at it, be sure to note the headlines of all the articles you read. They can be a veritable gold mine of new words. Headline writers must find the shortest, sweetest way to capture the essence of a story, and often that means dredging up such stumpers as eschew, aver, impugn, distaff, and brute. Are you familiar with those words? Let's take a brief look at them. Eschew, e s c h e w, means to avoid, shun, as to eschew alcohol. Aver, a v e r, means to assert, declare, state positively, as to aver one's faith or innocence. Impugn, i m p u g n, means to oppose in words, attack by argument, question or criticize the truth or integrity of, as to impugn authority. Or impugn someone's reputation. Distaff, d i s t a f f, means female, pertaining to women, as in the distaff side of a family, which is opposed to the spear side, the male line of descent. Finally, to brute, b r u i t, means to report widely, spread the word. As the scandal was bruited in the media. If you have a hobby or particular area of interest outside of your occupation, you should subscribe to a publication that specializes in it. Articles on hunting, fishing, gardening, mechanics, parenting, cooking, antiques, travel, and a host of other subjects frequently contain uncommon words. For example, did you know that a stamp collector is called? A philatelist, philatelist begins with P H. A coin collector is a numismatist, and the word for a magician who specializes in sleight of hand is prestidigitator. You want to know how to spell prestidigitator? Hang on, it's a long one. P R E S T I D I G I T A T O R. In an article on exercise in a health magazine, you might run across a medical term like pulmonary, pertaining to the lungs, or vascular, pertaining to the blood vessels. In magazines specializing in food and wine, you may find such delicious words as gastronome, a lover and connoisseur of fine food, indigenous, belonging or native to a particular country or region, and sommelier. S O M M E L I E R, the wine steward in a restaurant. Recently, I read an article on the 19th century French painter Edgar Degas, D E G A S. It was published in a national fashion magazine that does not have a reputation for catering to a high vocabulary audience. In just the first two pages, however, I found the following high vocabulary words. Vignette, a literary sketch, short composition. Redolent, which means exuding a fragrance, aromatic. Simian, which means pertaining to or resembling an ape. Libido, which means sexual drive. Misogyny, which means hatred of women. Salacious, which means arousing sexual desire. Assiduous. Which means careful and persistent, and ennui, e n n u i, which means boredom or a state of weary dissatisfaction. The point is, interesting, challenging, and useful words are everywhere in your everyday reading if you want to find them.
The key is to keep your eyes and ears open and don't let any of them slip by. So whenever you read, make a conscious effort to look for words you don't know. And keep a dictionary handy while you're reading so you can look them up right away. If you can't always read with a dictionary beside you, then highlight or underline the unfamiliar words in your reading, or dog-ear the pages on which they occur, so you can look up the words later. Reading with an eye for words you don't know and reading with a dictionary are the two best ways you can continue to enrich your vocabulary after you complete the Verbal Advantage program. Now to delve into the second level of the Verbal Advantage vocabulary. Here are the first ten key words. Word 1. Advocate. A-D-V-O-C-A-T-E. To support. Plead for. Be in favor of. Defend by argument. Especially, to speak or write in favor or in defense of a person or cause. Synonyms include champion, endorse, and espouse. Advocate comes from the Latin ad, to, and vocare, to call, summon. You can hear the Latin vocare, to call, summon, in the English words vocation, a calling, profession, avocation, a hobby, sideline, subordinate occupation, and vocational, pertaining to an occupation or trade. Combine the Latin vocare, to call, with the prefix con, together, and you get the more difficult English words convoke, which means to call together, and convocation, the act of calling together or a group that has been summoned. Combine the single-letter prefix e, which is short for the Latin ex, out, with vocare, to call, and you get the English words evoke, to call out, call forth, summon, and evocative, calling forth a response, especially an emotional response. Vocare also can be heard in the common word vocal, spoken, oral, inclined to speak out. An advocate is a vocal supporter or defender of a cause, a champion. He is an outspoken advocate of handgun control. An advocate may also be a person who speaks for another. For example, a lawyer who pleads a case before a court. To advocate means to support, plead for, defend by argument. Their organization advocates educational reform. Educational reform. Educational reform. Word two. Delegate. D-E-L-E-G-A-T-E. -E -E. To entrust with authority or power. Deliver to another's care or management. Hand over to an agent or representative. The executive director delegated various managerial duties to her assistant. Our department chief has trouble letting go of the reins and delegating responsibility. Word 3. Unprecedented. U-N-P-R-E C E D E N T E D. Unheard of, novel, new, having no precedent or parallel, having no prior example. A precedent is an authoritative example, something done or said that may serve as a reason to justify a later act or statement. Precedent is often used specifically of a legal decision or case used as an example or as authorization in a subsequent decision or case. Unprecedented means without a precedent, without prior example or justification, and so unheard of, novel, new. Word 4. Poignant. P-O-I-G-N. A N T. Piercing, sharp, biting, penetrating, keen. 
poignant is used to mean piercing, sharp, or penetrating in three ways. First, it may mean keenly affecting the senses, a poignant odor, poignant beauty, a poignant look. Second, it may mean piercing or penetrating to the feelings, emotionally touching, painfully moving, a poignant drama, a poignant family reunion. Third, it may mean biting, cutting, acute, piercingly effective, poignant wit, poignant delight, a poignant critique. The odd spelling of poignant, with its silent G, comes from French. The word ultimately comes from the Latin pungere, to pierce or prick. Pungere is also the source of puncture, to pierce. Pungent, piercing to the smell or taste. And expunge, to punch out, erase, delete. The editor expunged all potentially offensive and derogatory material from the book. Poignant means piercing or penetrating to the senses, to the emo... Word 5. Nebulous. N-E-B-U-L-O-U-S. Unclear. Vague. Obscure. Hazy. Indefinite indistinct. In astronomy, the word nebula, N-E-B-U-L-A, refers to a cloudy mass of dust or gas visible between stars in space. The plural is nebulae, N-E-B-U-L-A-E. The adjectives nebular and nebulous both come from a Latin word meaning cloudy, misty, foggy, like a nebula. And according to dictionaries, both words may still be used in this sense. It is probably best, however, to let nebular take over the meaning cloudy, misty, vaporous, and to use nebulous in its more popular sense of vague, indefinite, hazy, unclear, as in nebulous writing, a nebulous idea a nebulous purpose or goal. Word 6. Clandestine. C-L-A-N-D-E-S-T-I-N-E. Kept secret, done in secrecy, especially for an evil, immoral, or illegal purpose. A clandestine affair. A clandestine business deal a clandestine intelligence operation. Synonyms include private, concealed, covert, underhand, sly, stealthy, furtive, and surreptitious. S-U-R-R-E-P-T-I-T-I-O-U-S. Clandestine is sometimes pronounced clandestine, 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 or clandestine. You should avoid all these recent variants. The traditional and preferred pronunciation is clandest. Word 7. Tirade. T-I-R-A-D-E. A long, drawn-out speech, especially a vehement and abusive one. After suffering through yet another one of his boss's frequent tirades, Joe decided it was time to quit and move on. Tirades have three characteristics. They are protracted, drawn out to great length. They are vituperative, full of harsh, abusive language. And they are censorious, meaning that they tend to censor, to blame or condemn. Tirade may also be pronounced with the accent on the second syllable, tirade. Word 8. Recur. R-E-C-U-R. To happen again. Occur again. 
especially at intervals or after some lapse of time. In The Careful Writer, Theodore Bernstein explains the difference between the words recur and reoccur. Both mean to happen again, he says, but reoccur suggests a one-time repetition, whereas recur suggests repetition more than once. Thus, you would say, the revolt is not likely to reoccur. But, as long as these skirmishes recur, the revolt will continue. Here's another example. If economists predict that a recession will reoccur in this decade, that means they're predicting it will happen only one more time. If economists predict that recession recurs on average every 10 years, then they're predicting it happens again and again at intervals. Bernstein says, and I quote, It is the ability to feel a fine distinction such as this and to choose the word that precisely expresses the thought that marks the writer of competence and taste. Word 9. Tacit. T-A-C-I-T. Unspoken. Silent. Implied or understood without words. Tacit is most often used to mean done or made in silence, not expressed or declared openly. Tacit consent is approval given without words, perhaps with a look or a nod. A tacit agreement is an unspoken understanding, one arrived at in silence. Tacit comes from the Latin tacere, to be silent, hold one's tongue, the source also of the word taciturn, reserved, uncommunicative, inclined to hold one's tongue. Word 10. Allegation. A-L-L-E-G-A-T-I-O-N. An assertion or declaration especially one made without proof. In law, an allegation is an assertion of what one intends to prove. Often the word implies an unsupportable assertion. The judge dismissed the allegations, citing lack of evidence to support them. A spokesperson for the company today denied the allegations of wrongdoing Let's review the 10 words you've just learned. Listen carefully to the following questions. After each one, decide whether the correct answer is yes or no. Can someone advocate an unworthy cause? Yes. To advocate means to support, be in favor of, defend by argument. One may advocate any cause either worthy or unworthy. Can you seize or maintain control by delegating it? No. To delegate means to entrust with authority or power, hand over management or control to another. If something has happened before, is it unprecedented? No. Unprecedented means unheard of, novel, new, having no precedent or prior example. Can a strong odor, a passionate and persuasive speech, and an emotionally moving story all be described as poignant? Yes. Poignant means piercing, sharp, keen penetrating to the senses, the mind, or the emotions. Can a poignant sensation or thought be nebulous? No. Nebulous means unclear, hazy, vague, indistinct, obscure. Are clandestine arrangements made in public? No. Clandestine means kept secret done in secrecy, especially for an evil, immoral, or illegal purpose. 
are tirades ever delivered in a clandestine manner? No, a tirade is a long, drawn-out speech, especially a vehement and abusive one. Could an unprecedented event ever recur? No, unprecedented means unheard of, never having happened before. Recur means to happen again, especially at intervals or after some lapse of time. Is an oral agreement also a tacit agreement? No, oral means expressed through spoken words. Tacit means unspoken, silent, implied or understood without words. Can a tirade contain an allegation? Yes, an allegation is an assertion or declaration, especially one made without proof. Let's move on now and learn the next 10 keywords in level 2. Here they are. Word 11. Gullible. G-U-L-L-I-B-L-E. Easily deceived, fooled, or cheated. A more difficult synonym of gullible is Credulous, C-R-E-D-U-L-O-U-S. Credulous comes from the Latin credere, to believe, and means inclined to believe, willing to accept something as true without questioning. To gull is to take advantage of someone who is foolish, unwary, or inexperienced. The gullible person is easily gulled fooled, cheated. To dupe and to gull both mean to take advantage of. Dupe suggests unwariness on the part of word 12, benign, b-e-n-i-g-n, kindly, good-natured, gracious, mild, having or showing a gentle disposition, as a benign old man. A benign smile, a benign intention, a benign government. That is the first meaning of benign listed in dictionaries, and probably the most common. The word is also used in several other ways. It may mean favorable, positive, propitious, a benign omen, a benign view. It may be used of the weather or climate to mean healthful, wholesome, salubrious. And in medicine, benign means mild, not de Word 13, peripheral, P-E-R-I-P-H-E-R-A-L. External, outer, lying at or forming the outside or boundary of something. Hence, not essential, irrelevant. The noun periphery means the boundary, the external surface or area. It may be used literally, as in exploring the periphery of the polar ice cap, situated on the periphery of the combat zone. Or it may be used figuratively, as in the periphery of consciousness, the periphery of one's sphere of influence. Peripheral may mean external in the literal sense of lying at the edge or on the boundary, or external in the figurative sense of irrelevant, non-essential, as peripheral issues, a peripheral point, or peripheral considerations. Word 14. Rebuff. R-E-B-U-F-F. -F. To refuse bluntly, reject sharply, turn down abruptly, snub, spurn. In colloquial terms, that is, in informal conversational language, rebuff means to give the cold shoulder to, slam the door on, nix. A rebuff is an abrupt refusal or rejection, especially of a request, an offer to help, or a person making advances. To rebuff means to refuse or reject bluntly.
Word 15. Animosity. A N I M O S I T Y. Ill will, hostility, antagonism, strong dislike or hatred. There was long standing animosity between the two families. After her co worker apologized for his rude remarks, she resolved not to harbor any animosity toward him. More difficult synonyms of animosity include malice, aversion, malevolence, antipathy, rancor, and enmity. Word 16. Tenuous. T-E-N-U-O-U-S. Thin, slender, slight. Flimsy, weak, not dense or substantial, lacking a strong basis. At high altitudes, air is tenuous, thin. In chemistry, certain fluids or compounds are said to be tenuous, not dense. In general non-scientific usage, tenuous refers to something weak or flimsy that has little substance or strength. A tenuous grip a tenuous proposal, a tenuous argument, or tenuous construction. Word 17. Complacent. C-O-M-P-L-A-C-E-N-T. Self-satisfied, smug, overly pleased with oneself. Complacent suggests being so satisfied with one's abilities, advantages, or circumstances that one lacks proper concern for the condition of others and is unaware of the situation around one. A complacent smile is a smug, self-satisfied smile. Complacent behavior is self-centered and disregards others' concerns. A complacently ignorant person is completely satisfied with his ignorance. He does not know he lacks knowledge and would not care if he did. Complacent, spelled C-O-M-P-L-A-C-E-N-T, and complacent, spelled C-O-M-P-L-A-I-S-A-N-T, should be distinguished in spelling, pronunciation, and meaning. Complacent, with a Z sound in the final syllable, means inclined to please, gracious, obliging, courteous, affable, urbane. It has a positive connotation. Complacent, with an S sound in the final syllable, has a negative connotation. Complacent means self-satisfied, smug, overly pleased with oneself. Word 18. Acme. A-C-M-E. The peak, highest point, summit, zenith, especially the point of culmination, the highest possible point in the development or progress of something. Here's a funny story about vocabulary development. I learned the word Acme as a young boy watching the Roadrunner cartoons on television, in which Wiley Coyote uses various products made by the Acme Company in his obsessive quest to capture the Roadrunner. Of course, the coyote's plans always backfire, and he usually winds up flying headlong over some precipitous cliff. Through the power of association, I have since connected the height of those cliffs with the word acme, the peak, highest point. You see, even watching television can help you build your vocabulary. However, listening to verbal advantage and reading widely are still more effective methods. Acme comes directly from a Greek word meaning the highest point, extremity. The word is often used figuratively to mean the highest point in the development or progress of something, as in the acme of his career, a company at the acme of the industry. The corresponding adjective is acmatic. Albert Einstein's theory of relativity was an acmatic scientific breakthrough. The antonym of acme is nadir, N-A-D-I-R, which means the lowest point. Word 19, defunct, 
D E F U N C T. Dead, extinct, obsolete, no longer in existence, effect, operation, or use. Defunct comes from the Latin defunctus, dead, departed, finished. A defunct law is no longer in existence or effect. A defunct organization is no longer functioning or doing business. A defunct factory is no longer in operation. A defunct procedure is no longer in use. A defunct species is extinct. A defunct expression is no longer in use. A defunct idea is no longer useful or popular, and a defunct person is dead. Word twenty. A bet. A B E T. To encourage, support, help, aid, promote, assist in achieving a purpose. Some dictionaries note that a bet means especially to encourage or assist in wrongdoing, as in the legal cliche, to aid and abet, meaning to assist a criminal in the commission of a crime. That sense is perhaps more common, but a bet may also be used favorably, as to abet the cause of justice, to abet the committee's efforts to get the plan approved. Let's review the ten words you've just learned. Listen carefully to the following statements, and decide whether each one is true or false. A gullible person is hard to fool. False. Gullible means easily deceived, fooled, or cheated. A benign expression is a gentle, good-natured expression. True, benign means kindly, good-natured, gracious, mild. If something's peripheral, it's essential. False, peripheral means external, on the outside or boundary of something, hence not essential, irrelevant. To rebuff a request or proposal is to reconsider it. False. Rebuff means to refuse bluntly, reject sharply, snub, spurn. A benign person is full of animosity. False. A benign person is gracious, good-natured. Animosity means hatred, hostility, ill will, strong dislike. A tenuous grasp of the facts is weak or insubstantial. True, tenuous means thin, weak, flimsy, lacking substance or strength. Complacent people are thoughtful and considerate of others. False, complacent means self-satisfied, smug, overly pleased with oneself. The peak of a person's career is the acme. True. Acme means the peak, summit, highest point. A defunct corporation is likely to grow and turn a profit. False. Defunct means dead, extinct, obsolete, no longer in existence, effect, operation, or use. You can abet a criminal or abet a worthy cause. True, to abet is to encourage, support, assist in achieving a purpose. It may be used of offering aid to good people or purposes, as well as to those that are bad. That concludes the review. Let's take a moment to debunk a widely held superstition about good usage. By the way, debunk, spelled D-E-B-U-N-K, means to expose as false, deceitful, or exaggerated. To prove that something is bunkum, foolish and insincere. Do you remember the old rule? 
don't end a sentence with a preposition? Well, it's too bad it was ever taught, for it is wrong, wrong, wrong. If you think I'm cracked, that I don't know what I'm talking about, then I dare you to say, you don't know about what you're talking. A while ago, while visiting relatives, I met a woman who was studying to be a teacher. She had just received a misguided lecture on the evils of ending a sentence with a preposition. How long are you staying for, she asked me. Then, embarrassed, she changed that perfectly natural sentence to, for how long are you staying, which made her sound like Eliza Doolittle practicing for her next pinky-in-the-air tea party. For years, Miss Thistlebottom has been teaching her bright-eyed brats that no writer would end a sentence with a preposition, says Theodore Bernstein in The Careful Writer, a book that anyone who puts words on paper should keep close at hand. The truth, Bernstein asserts, is that no good writer would follow Miss Thistlebottom's rule, although he might occasionally examine it to see if there was any merit in it. Bernstein was assistant managing editor of the New York Times, an associate professor in Columbia University's School of Journalism, and a respected arbiter on English usage. Bernstein maintains that sentences that end with prepositions are, and I quote, idiomatic and have been constructed that way from Shakespeare's We Are Such Stuff As Dreams Are Made On to today's Music To Read By. They are a natural manner of expression. Examine a handful. It's nothing to sneeze at. Something to guard against. You don't know what I've been through. He is a man who can be counted on. I'm not sure what the cake was made of. Surely there is nothing amiss with these idiomatic constructions. Woe to Miss Thistlebottom if she tries to correct them. She won't have a leg on which to stand. Back in 1926, the legendary English grammarian H.W. Fowler, in his classic guide, Modern English Usage, called the rule about prepositions a cherished superstition. According to Fowler, and I quote, those who lay down the universal principle that final prepositions are inelegant are unconsciously trying to deprive the English language of a valuable idiomatic resource, which has been used freely by all our greatest writers except those whose instinct for English idiom has been overpowered by notions of correctness derived from Latin standards. The legitimacy of the prepositional ending in literary English must be uncompromisingly maintained, says Fowler. In respect of elegance or inelegance, every example must be judged not by any arbitrary rule, but on its own merits, according to the impression it makes on the feeling of educated English readers. End quote. Hundreds of great writers from Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Milton to Herman Melville, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, and Toni Morrison all have written intelligible, graceful, idiomatic sentences that ended with a preposition. To say those writers were wrong is like saying everyone in baseball's Hall of Fame didn't know a thing about how to play the game. The best contemporary writers also do not hesitate to let a preposition end a sentence when it pleases the ear and they avoid doing so when it does not. So, the next time some nitpicking Miss Thistlebottom says you mustn't end a sentence with a preposition, try this retort. You, dear sir or madam, may twist your syntax into knots if you like, but please refrain from telling the rest of us what to end our sentences with. And that, as the saying goes, is what it all boils down to. Let's move on now to the next 10 keywords in level 2. Word 21. Haggard. H A G G A R D. Worn out, tired, gaunt, drawn, emaciated. A person who is haggard has a wild-eyed and wasted look, as from exhaustion, illness, or grief. Haggard is another word whose meaning I remember through the power of association. When I read King Solomon's Minds by H. Ryder Haggard, I imagined the author as being as worn out and wild-eyed as his characters were by the end of their harrowing adventure. But you don't need to go through a death-defying experience to look or feel haggard. 
long hours at work, lack of sleep, or inadequate nutrition can easily make you haggard, worn out, tired, wasted, gaunt. Word 22. Wave. W-A-I-V-E. To relinquish voluntarily. Give up. Forego. To relinquish implies giving up something one doesn't want to part with, either out of necessity or because one has been compelled or forced. To relinquish possession. To relinquish command. To waive implies a voluntary refusal to insist on one's right or claim to something. To waive one's right to a trial by jury. To waive one's claim on a title or property. Waive may also mean to postpone, defer, or dispense with, as to waive discussion, or to waive formalities and get on with business. Word 23. Carnal. C-A-R-N-A-L. Bodily. Pertaining to the flesh as opposed to the spirit. Sensual. Corporeal. Carnal is not used to mean bodily in a general or neutral sense. We do not say carnal functions or carnal aches and pains. Carnal refers to the basic physical appetites of the body, especially the sexual appetite. We speak of carnal desires, carnal lust, carnal knowledge. Word 24. Sanction. S-A-N-C-T-I-O-N. To approve, allow, permit, authorize. Certify. Ratify. To sanction, certify, and ratify all mean to approve. Ratify means to officially approve something done by a representative, to ratify a treaty. Certify means to officially approve compliance with requirements or standards. A certified public accountant. Sanction means to give authoritative approval. The company's board of directors sanctioned the merger. Many religions do not sanction unmarried sexual relations. The law sanctions free speech, but not antisocial behavior. Word 25. Ambiguous. A-M-B-I-G-U-O-U-S. Uncertain, unclear, doubtful, dubious, questionable, puzzling, having an obscure or indefinite meaning. By derivation, ambiguous means having two or more possible meanings, capable of being understood in more than one way. An ambiguous intention is uncertain, difficult to determine and therefore questionable, dubious. An ambiguous statement is puzzling because it can be interpreted in more than one way. It is unclear and indefinite. More difficult synonyms of ambiguous include enigmatic, cryptic, and equivocal. Antonyms of ambiguous include distinct, apparent, evident, conspicuous, and manifest. Word 26. Spendthrift. S-P-E-N-D-T-H-R-I-F-T. Wasteful. Spending extravagantly or foolishly. Squandering one's resources. His spendthrift habits will put the company out of business. You may use spendthrift either as an adjective, meaning wasteful, spending extravagantly, or as a noun to mean a wasteful person, someone who foolishly squanders money or resources. There isn't a thrifty bone in his body. He's a gambler and a spendthrift to the core. The words improvident, prodigal, profligate, and spendthrift 
all mean wasteful, spending thoughtlessly or squandering one's resources. Improvident means literally not provident, not providing for the future. The improvident person does not save money for retirement or for a rainy day. Prodigal is a close synonym of spendthrift and means spending money in a reckless or extravagant way, usually to support a lavish or luxurious lifestyle. In the Bible, the famous parable about the prodigal son tells of a young man who wasted his inheritance but was forgiven by his father. Profligate means extremely prodigal or spendthrift. It refers specifically to a person who spends money with reckless abandon and lives a life shamelessly devoted to pleasure. A profligate Hollywood movie star who squandered his fortune in exclusive nightclubs and casinos. Spendthrift means wasteful, spending extravagantly. The taxpayers want a more efficient and less spendthrift government. Word 27. Mollify. M-O-L-L-I-F-Y. To calm, soothe, pacify, appease, soften in feeling or tone, make less harsh or severe. Nothing mollified his anger. Mollify comes from the Latin mollus, soft, and facere, to make, and means literally to make soft. Also from the Latin mollus, soft, comes the word emollient, E-M-O-L-L-I-E-N-T. As an adjective, emollient means softening, soothing, mollifying. As a noun, it means a softening or soothing agent, such as a lotion or cream for the skin. The verb to mollify once meant literally to make soft or tender, as to mollify meat, tenderize it. That sense is now obsolete, and mollify today is used to mean to soften in feeling or tone, calm, soothe, make less harsh or severe. The union leaders decided to mollify their demands. A good manager should be adept at mollifying conflicts that can damage morale. The plaintiff's attorney said that only a million-dollar settlement would mollify the pain and suffering her client had suffered. Word 28. Unequivocal. U-N-E-Q-U-I-V-O-C-A-L. Clear and direct. Definite. Straightforward. Certain. Having a single, obvious meaning capable of being interpreted in only one way. Unequivocal, clear and direct, and ambiguous, uncertain, unclear, are antonyms. Unequivocal combines the common prefix un, which means not, with the word equivocal, a synonym of ambiguous. Equivocal language can be interpreted in several ways. It is deliberately vague, evasive, or ambiguous. Unequivocal language is clear, straightforward, and direct. Reporters are so accustomed to equivocal answers from government officials that they are often surprised and suspicious when they get an unequivocal response. Now that you know the meaning of unequivocal, I'd like to caution you about how you pronounce it. I have heard many educated speakers add a syllable to the word and say, unequivocable. And I have even seen the word misspelled in books and magazines to reflect the mispronunciation. No matter who you hear saying unequivocable, it's incorrect, a beastly mispronunciation. Unequivocal ends with vocal, V-O-C-A-L, not vocable, V-O-C-A-B-L-E. Take care to pronounce the word in five syllables. Unequivocal. Word 29. Malleable. M-A-L-L-E-A-B-L-E. 
capable of being shaped, able to be molded or manipulated, adaptable, impressionable. Certain metals, such as gold and iron, are malleable. They can be molded or shaped. In a figurative sense, malleable can also apply to a person or abstract thing that can be molded or shaped. For example, a young person's mind may be malleable, impressionable, capable of being shaped. Or an idea may be malleable, adaptable, capable of being shaped to fit various purposes. Malleable and the challenging word tractable are close in meaning. Malleable comes from the Latin maleare, to hammer, and means literally capable of being hammered into a desired shape. Tractable comes from the Latin tractare, to handle, manage, haul or drag along. From the same source comes the familiar word tractor, the farm vehicle used to pull wagons, mowers, and other agricultural equipment. By derivation, that which is tractable can be pulled or hauled. Hence, a tractable person is manageable, easily handled. A malleable person or thing is easily hammered into shape and therefore is adaptable, impressionable. Antonyms of malleable and tractable include inflexible, unyielding, stubborn, obstinate, and intransigent. Word 30. Verbose. V-E-R-B-O-S-E. -E. Wordy. Having too many words. Long-winded. Full of verbiage. More difficult synonyms of verbose include garrulous, loquacious, voluble, and prolix. Verbose refers to speech or writing that uses more words than necessary to get the point across. The corresponding noun is verbosity, wordiness, long-windedness, and overabundance of words. If you've been listening to this program from the beginning, as I've recommended, by now you probably are well aware that the esteemed author and narrator of Verbal Advantage is sometimes prone to verbosity. But seriously, whenever you see the letters V-E-R-B in a word, you can safely assume that the meaning of the whole word has something to do with words. That's because most English words containing V-E-R-B come from the Latin verbum, word. By the way, verbum is spelled V-E-R-B-U-M, but in classical Latin, V is pronounced like W. From the Latin verbum, word, come the English words verbal, pertaining to or expressed in words, verbatim, expressed in precisely the same words, verbiage, an excess or overabundance of words, and verbose, wordy, long-winded, using more words than necessary to get the point across. Since I'm already waxing verbose about words from the Latin verbum, word, allow me to digress even further and proffer a few words of advice on the words verbal and verbiage. Are you familiar with the verb to proffer, spelled P-R-O-F-F-E-R? It means to put forward for acceptance, present as a gift, as to proffer one's services, or to proffer friendship. But back to the word verbiage, which is often mispronounced verbiage, as if it had only two syllables. Carriage and marriage have two syllables, but verbiage and foliage have three. Try not to say verbiage and foliage, or even worse, foliage. You will hear many educated people mispronounce these words, but believe me when I say that careful speakers consider the three-syllable variants truly beastly mispronunciations. Take care to pronounce these words in three syllables. Verbiage and foliage. Now for a word to the wise on the proper use of verbal. You will often hear or read such phrases as 
a verbal agreement or a verbal understanding. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself exactly what they mean? If you're like most people, you probably figured that a verbal agreement or a verbal understanding meant one that was arrived at through conversation, one that was spoken but not written down. And therein lies the problem. The word oral means spoken, not written. And the precise meaning of verbal is expressed in words, either orally or in writing. Too often, verbal, expressed in words, is used to mean oral, spoken. And the message that results from that confusion is usually ambiguous. For example, listen to this sentence, which I found recently in the business section of my local newspaper. Ensure all promises made verbally are included, in writing, in the contract. As written, the sentence means that we should make sure that all promises, both spoken and written, are included in the contract. The writer wants to say that we should put all spoken promises in writing. But to convey that meaning precisely, the sentence should have read like this. Ensure all promises made orally are included in the contract. In the future, whenever you refer to promises, agreements, or understandings, remember that if they are expressed in speech, they are oral. And if they are expressed in words, whether spoken or written, they are verbal. Of course, if they are expressed in too many words, like most long-winded legal contracts, then they are verbose, full of verbiage. 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 Let's review the ten key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you two words, and you decide if they are synonyms or antonyms. Are you ready? Here we go. Energetic and haggard are... Antonyms. Haggard means worn out, tired, gaunt, emaciated. To wave and to relinquish are synonyms. Wave means to relinquish or give up voluntarily. Spiritual and carnal are antonyms. Carnal means pertaining to the flesh as opposed to the spirit, bodily, sensual, corporeal. To sanction and to prohibit are antonyms. Sanction means to approve, allow, permit, authorize. Doubtful and ambiguous are synonyms. Ambiguous means uncertain, unclear, doubtful, having an obscure or indefinite meaning. Miserly and spendthrift are antonyms. Miserly means hoarding money. The miserly person is a penny pincher, cheapskate, skinflint. Spendthrift means wasteful, spending extravagantly. A spendthrift is a person who thoughtlessly wastes money. To mollify and to irritate are antonyms. To mollify means to calm, soothe, pacify, appease. Unequivocal and ambiguous are antonyms. Ambiguous means uncertain, unclear, indefinite. Unequivocal means clear and direct, definite, straightforward, having a single obvious meaning, capable of being interpreted in only one way. Adaptable and malleable are synonyms. Malleable means adaptable capable of being shaped or molded. Verbose and long-winded are 
Synonyms. Verbose means wordy, long-winded. That concludes